Well, I want to begin by asking you a question this morning. And the question is, why are you here today? It's a simple question, but one I think that we all need to understand. Why are you here today? Are you here out of tradition or habit? Did someone make you come to church today? Maybe inside you're secretly angry that you're in this building. You'd rather be home sleeping in the school <coughs> than here with us. Maybe you think this is the only day I have to spend any way I like. Why should I be in church? Are you here just so you can say that I went to church? Is church just something you do on Sunday morning? Are you just here to laugh together? To, to socialize? Is that why you're here? Why are you here this morning? Are you seeking God? Do you have a strong desire to see and to fellowship and to be with God's people? I hope and I pray that you are here because you know God and you want to worship Him. That is why you're here. To worship and to praise the Creator God who sits upon the throne and deserves all of our worship and praise. Amen. So let me ask you again, why are you here? Are you here for you? Or are you here for God? I would guess that in our service today, we may have someone in all of those categories. Let me reassure you, that God knows the motivation of each of our hearts. He knows why you think you're here. You're not hiding the reality from Him, and I don't care who you are or how well you play out your pretense, God knows and sees and He's not fooled by any of us. Oh, He desires our worship. In fact, the scripture says that God inhabits the praise of his people. And we need to worship him alone. This very morning when we were singing the psalms and the spiritual hymns, were you worshiping? Were you allowing your heart to be filled with the awe and wonder of the greatness of our God? Or were you just simply singing familiar words? Where's your heart at today? Jesus taught about different types of heart conditions. And we're going to be reading about his teaching this morning from the message in Matthew chapter 13. About that same time, Jesus left the house and sat on the beach. In no time at all, a crowd gathered along the shoreline, forcing him to get into the boat, using the boat, his, using the boat as his pulpit. He addressed the congregation and tells them a story. <laughs> what if you make of this, Jesus said, a farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road and the birds ate it. Some fell in the gravel. It sprouted quickly, but didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds. As it came up, it was strangled by the weeds. Some fell on good earth and produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Then Jesus, or then the disciples asked Jesus why he was teaching in parables. And basically, he tells them that the people are not able to understand the truth in its purest form. But then he tells them in verses 16 and 17, But you have God-blessed eyes, eyes that see, and God-blessed ears, ears that hear. 
A lot of people, prophets, and humble believers among them would have given anything to see what you were seeing, to hear what you were hearing, but never had the chance. As disciples of Christ, they had the special privilege of being taught by the Messiah himself. How awesome. Of course, we know the rest of the story. We have the scriptures. But how often do we read them? How often do we read? How often do we ask the Holy Spirit to give us understanding of what we do not know? Do you ever ask God to open your eyes and your ears so that you can really hear the Word of God? We need to ask God to give us God-blessed eyes, eyes that see, and God-blessed ears, ears that hear. We need that. Jesus is so patient and kind, he explains the parables to his disciples. And we're going to continue reading in verse 18. This is heart condition number one. A farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road, and the birds ate it. That was what he told. Here is his explanation. Study this story of the farmer planting seed. When anyone hears news of the kingdom and doesn't take it in, it just remains on the surface. And so the evil one comes along and plucks it right out of the person's heart. This is the seed the farmer scattered on the road. You see, a pathway or a road is dirt that has been trodden over and over and over again. It can be a single pathway or it can be traveled on by many. But let me assure you that the crowd is not always right. Just because the, word, the road is well traveled doesn't mean that it's the right one. Twice in the book of Proverbs, in chapter 14 and 16, it says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. We have two warnings about that. Matthew 7, 13b reminds us, For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. A well-traveled road becomes compacted, and it's extremely hard to penetrate. When a person is compacted, they already have their mind made up about what they believe. Most of the time, not even the truth can penetrate their heart. Even when the word of God is spoken and heard, the heart is so hard that Satan comes along and snatches it out before it even has a chance to take hold. Now maybe Saul of Tarsus jumps to your mind. As someone who was hard-hearted, but God was able to use anyway. But you need to remember, Saul thought he was doing wonderful things for God. Saul was defending God. His heart was not hardened towards God. He was just sadly, very badly mistaken about his zeal for God. So look here at your own heart this morning. If you're only here because you have to be, ask the Lord if you have a hardened heart. Even if he tells you yes, it's not too late, or you wouldn't ask the question in the first place. Heart condition number two. Jesus first said, some fell in the gravel, it sprouted quickly, but didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Jesus' explanation. 
The seed cast in the gravel. This is the person who hears and instantly responds with enthusiasm. But there is no soil of character. And so when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arises, there is nothing to show for it. Eric, are we still on the first part? You want to know we're on two? Okay. All right, thank you. Sometimes people truly get saved, but don't understand that although salvation is a free gift to us, it costs us some things too. Things we previously enjoyed. Things we did. People we thought were great to be around. And it's not that we have to give up those things before Jesus accepts us. We give them up because they no longer match up to what Jesus wants for us. People with this heart condition may learn a few things about this Christian walk, but then when trouble comes, and it will, they instantly fade away from their relationship with Jesus and his church. Now why am I so sure that trouble will come? Every person, every one of us, every single person is a sinner and is in conflict with God, which really means you're on the other team, you're not on God's team. Well, when a player switches teams, the head coach doesn't like it. And in our case, Satan, and his, Satan is our enemy. And he hates it when he loses one of his players to God. And he will do whatever it takes to take you down. Remember, his M.O. is to seek you out, to steal, kill, and destroy. That's who Satan is. Now, we're not to worry about those who can kill our body, but we are to be concerned about the one who can destroy our soul. Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy you. Everything about you, he wants to destroy you. And we cannot defeat him all by ourselves. Lack of character or just emotions for God are just short-lived. But commitment, commitment to God will see you through. Is your heart in this condition today? Do you blame God for your trials? <coughs> Do you think he's abandoned you in your time of need? Have you been ridiculed for your faith and so, oh, deny <coughs> Jesus. I don't, want to, I don't want people to make fun of me. I've even heard people say, yeah, I tried Jesus. It just didn't work for me. Well, I got news for you. You're right. Jesus doesn't work for us. He's not for hire. He's not a genie in a bottle for you to call out when you need something. Jesus Christ gave up his life so that you and I might have a restored relationship with a holy God. Something that is not possible without him. Oh, that would have eyes to see and ears to hear. The third heart condition. Jesus' parable says some fell in the weeds. As it came up, it was strangled by the weeds. The seed, his explanation, the seed cast into the weeds is the person who hears the kingdom news. But weeds of worry and illusions about getting more and wanting everything under the sun strangle out what was heard and nothing comes of it. This person's heart is open to the gospel. It accepts it. And then it is so distracted by the world that the things of the earth grow in importance to them. What is on your mind right now this very minute? Is it worries? 
Do you allow worry to overtake you? Are you so full of worry you can't think of anything else besides what you're worried about? <coughs> maybe, maybe you think about fame. Not to super star status, not to movie star status. Maybe. But maybe you want people to like you. Maybe you want people to be like you. Maybe that's your focus. Maybe you want people to notice you. Do you constantly dream about wealth? Getting more and more and more things is important to you. Now there's nothing wrong with the gift of being able to make money. But is that what you think and dream about? Are you a workaholic? To what end? All these things come to nothing in the end. Do you see? The, did you listen to the end of the verse? It says nothing comes of it. Nothing. <clears throat> the fourth heart condition. This last heart is what we all need to be striving for. Jesus said some fell on good earth and produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. And then he explains it like this. The seed cast on good earth is the person who hears and takes in the news and then produces a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. When you accept Christ as your Savior, He cleanses you and places in you good soil because without Him, there is no good thing in you or in me. There's nothing good in me except Jesus. And even if you think you're a good person, there is nothing good in you except Jesus if you have him as your Savior. If you don't have Jesus as your Savior, there is no good thing in you. Even if you're nice, even if you're kind, even if you live a moral life, there's no good thing in you without Jesus Christ. Amen. Within this good soil, your new life begins to take root. Here's the difference. When trials come, and they will, you cling to Jesus. You don't turn away from him. This good soil is to produce a harvest. But what harvest is he talking about? He's talking about you living your life pleasing and acceptable in his sight. But that begs the question, what's acceptable? Jesus said, be holy as I am holy. That's the answer. Jesus first, others second, and yourself a distant, distant last. Here are some things in no particular order and certainly not all inclusive. One, study and apply the Word of God. You must study God's Word for yourself. Only hearing the Word of God from the pulpit once a week, that's like me eating a meal once a week for you and telling you you're full. Well, you say, well, I need to eat more often than that. I know. We need to eat every day. Most of us eat three meals a day. We feed our human body. We need to feed our spirit with the Word of God. You have to read this every day to get nourishment for your spirit. Once a week is not enough. We need to study and apply it. You see, all the head knowledge in the world doesn't help you if you have no heart for it and no ability or no desire to follow it. 
You see, I can tell you to go up the street, turn right. But if you don't listen, you're not going to end up where I want you to be. The same thing holds true for God. If we don't listen to God's direction, we will not end up where he wants us to be. The next two go together. Submitting to God's authority and obedience. They go together. God always wants what is best for us. He doesn't want what is okay. He doesn't want for you what is good. He wants for you what is best. What is best. And he knows what best is. You see, we struggle against God because deep down, we're not really sure we trust him. We say we do, but we think we know better than he does. And really, we want it our own way. We want God to move the way we want him to move, not the way he knows is best. We have got to get over ourselves and seek God with our whole heart. We have got to get over ourselves and seek God with our whole heart. Prayer. Prayer is vital. That's our communication with God. You, you would never get married and then never talk to your spouse. Accepting Christ as your personal Savior is a commitment. And He desires to talk with you all day long. Pray without ceasing. God cares. He's a great listener. He deserves our praise and our thanksgiving. But prayer is a two-way conversation. Let's see if this is true in your prayer life. Most of the time, we tell God what we want, and then we're done praying. God can't even get a word in edgewise. Because when we're done speaking, we're done. But prayer is also listening. You can't hear God speak unless you take time to listen. Help us, Lord, to have God-blessed ears so we can hear you. Part of the harvest is reaching out and bringing others to Jesus. The disciples did it, the early church did it, and we too are called to be fishers of men. When was the last time you went fishing for Jesus' sake? When we are growing in Christ, our trust should be growing, which should result in praise and thanksgiving. Since Christ gave his life up for me, I want to give him all of me and serve him in all the ways he directs. That should be your heart's cry as well. As a born-again Christian, I should be seeking the fullness of the Holy Spirit that produces spiritual fruit in me and then overflows to others. So is your cup being filled up? Is it being filled up to overflowing to others? It ought to be. We need to seek it if it's not. The greatest harvest is seeking God's glory, doing everything I do so that he is given all the glory and honor and praise that is due his great name. Reflecting any praise upward, reflecting any compliment upward, reflecting all glory to the Heavenly Father, that is what we were created to do. That's what I was created to do. Praise him from whom all blessings flow. Praise him. Give him honor and give him glory. 
What does that look like in everyday life? I want to share with you the lyrics of a song, Live Like That, by the contemporary Christian band, Sidewalk Prophets. And I want you to listen to the story that the lyrics tell. Sometimes I think, what will people say of me when I'm only just a memory, when I'm home where my soul belongs? Was I love when no one else would show up? Was I Jesus to the least of us? Was my worship more than just a song? I want to live like that and give it all I have so that everything I say and do points to you. If love is who I am, then this is where I'll stand, recklessly abandoned, never holding back. I want to live like that. I want to live like that. Am I proof that you are who you say you are? That grace can really change a heart? Do I live like your love is true? People pass. And even if they don't know my name, is there evidence that I've been changed? When they see me, do they see you? I want to live like that. And give it all I have so that everything I say and do points to you. If love is who I am and this is where I'll stand, recklessly abandoned, never holding back, I want to live like that. I want to live like that. I want to show the world the love you gave for me. And I'm longing for the world to know the glory of my King. I want to live like that. And give it all I have so that everything I say and do points to you. If love is who I am, then this is where I'll stand. Recklessly abandoned, never holding back. I want to live like that. I want to live like that. I want to live like that. Jesus is looking for the heart of people to bear fruit and produce a harvest. As we listen to this song, ask God to search your heart and seize what lies within you. What is your heart condition this morning? Sometimes I think, what will people say of me when I'm only just a man?
heart's cry this morning? Is that your heart's condition this morning? Donna Lee, would you come and begin playing the, just the last song? Maybe the chorus group. I know Satan doesn't want any of you to heed God's tug in your heart this morning. I know that. But if you are feeling the Holy Spirit's tug, these prayer altars are open. What is your heart condition this morning? Come and kneel before Almighty God and share your heart's need with Him. He wants to talk to you today, to cleanse you, to mold you, and make you totally His. Would you stand with me, please? Is that your heart's cry this morning, to live like that? Where people look at you and they see Jesus Christ. That you want your entire life to bring him all praise and honor and glory. Let us close in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today. And as your Holy Spirit goes through this congregation, Father, I ask that you search each heart here today. And Father, I pray that you would motivate your people to be honest with you, to confess before you their heart's condition, so that you might place within us good soil to produce much fruit beyond our wildest imagination. That is our heart's desire this morning, Lord. That's my heart's desire for myself and for our people. Lord, that we would produce much holy fruit for Almighty God, out in our workplace, out in our homes, out in our communities, out in our neighborhoods, as we pass by people, do we realize, Lord, without Jesus Christ, the people we pass by will spend an eternity, eternity in hell. Have us, Lord, have compassion. Give us words to speak. Give us courage to obey and share the love of Christ with those around us. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.